In this episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to talk about medical emergencies. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today, we're going to be discussing the article, Man Down, Knowing What to Do in a Medical Emergency. If you'd like to read that article, go to our website, sheepdogchurchsecurity.net, and look under the news tab. So let's begin in the Bible as we always do. This is Luke 10 verse 34 and it reads like this. And the Samaritan went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So this is one of our great callings, right? Our job is to provide medical assistance during a medical emergencies at the church. So we have to be prepared. We have to be trained. We have to have the right equipment in order to respond to these situations that if they haven't already happened at your church, they're coming and they're coming soon. So let's get into some news stories here. This one is Starkville, Mississippi, September 24th, 2021. So this was just a few months back, actually, about four or five months. Okay, so a crew was replacing a uh, church roof when a lift tipped over, injuring two brothers. One was trapped, and it took dozens of people to get him out. So here's a situation where you have contractors, other people working at the church, and, and either they're following safety protocols or not can result in injuries. And so you have to have people trained in in the area to respond to that kind of situation. Next one, New Albany, Mississippi. Another one in Mississippi, March 7, 2021. So almost a year ago, uh, pastor, um, the pastor of the church sat down after delivering a message, then had a massive heart attack. This was a week after a presentation about heart disease. When he dropped the microphone, church members came up quickly to perform CPR while medics were coming. He died anyway. So this is something that if you haven't learned already from CPR, it's not guaranteed. In fact, I heard that the percentage is as little as 8% survive, even though somebody is right there trained. And so the reason I share that statistic with you is not because it's like, okay, well, Why even bother then? Why go through the training if there's only an 8% survival rate? The point is, is there's an 8% survival rate. The other thing is, is most of the time when that statistic is given, it's given in the context of do it. Don't worry. You're not going to hurt them. You're not going to, you're not going to kill them from your CPR, your chest compressions. Go ahead and get out there and do it. You know, at least you got an 8%. I mean, they're going from 0% to 8%. That's quite quite an advantage and you don't have to worry about injuring them. The other thing is just the need of an AED because an AED can make all the difference in some of these situations. Next one is Chester, uh, Pennsylvania, December 4th, 2021. A drunk driver rolled into a parking lot of a church hitting several people leaving after a service. Six were injured. So here's kind of your mass trauma event, right? Do you have people trained? to respond, to provide that immediate aid and have the equipment to respond to that. Next one is uh, Reetham, Massachusetts, um, November 24th, 2019. A 75-year-old man uh, collapsed during mass. A nurse in the pew behind him responded immediately with CPR. Uh, She was relieved by responding police and then by medics. He survived. So there's that chance there, right? If you're trained and you're there and you're equipped, you can make a difference in somebody's life. And I'm betting to that old man, that older man, he's probably quite happy that there was someone there. All right, Columbia, Maryland, 2021. This was a while ago. Um, This March, Sandy Pope, who is now an associate pastor at Bridgeway Community Church, tells how 11 years earlier, a co-worker on a previous job suffered a heart attack. In her accounts, um, she describes the visible symptoms of her fellow employee, profuse sweating, difficulty breathing, clenching the chest. 911 call was called and medics responded. So this is part of 
how important it is for us to get medical training so we can recognize symptoms and then provide the appropriate treatment. Uh, the last story I have for you is um, San Jose, California, November 22nd, 2020. A homeless man sheltered in a church stabbed five persons, killing two. All right, once again, here's a story, mass casualty. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know if it's a drunk driver driving through the parking lot, plowing over several people. We don't know if it's going to be some violent intruder that stabs five people. We don't know what it is. So we have to be prepared for, uh, for many different types of medical emergencies. So before we continue, I am going to draw your attention to the show notes in the comments below. Make sure you click that link for the show notes. And then what you do is you put in your email and we immediately um, uh, send you an email with a PDF that has a, basically a summary of this article and this program. Make sure you check it out. Okay, so injuries and illnesses happen at churches. As simple as that. Like I said, if this hasn't already happened at your church, it's going to. And so that means that we need to be prepared and we need to be trained and have the proper equipment. Now, for most of us, what we need to do when we look at our churches, we kind of take have to take an inventory of who's in the congregation. What kind of uh, people, if you have personnel, human resources, do we have to respond to a medical emergency? So some of us have doctors. Some of us have nurses that actually come to church with us or first responders, you know, that could be police, paramedics, um, EMTs, all that kind of stuff. We need to take a look at those people and, and think of how we might use them in case of an emergency. Now, there's a couple of things to think about is, you know, let's say you have just one doctor or maybe you just have one nurse or one paramedic. You have to think about just when they're not there, right? I mean, you need to have more than just that one person or those couple of people. You want as many people trained in medical emergencies as possible. So once you've identified those people and you've recruited them, if you will, to be part of your medical response team, then you need to say, okay, who else can we get trained? I really believe the more people trained in emergency medical, the better. So that means, you know, you know, looking at the American Red Cross or the American Heart Association, there's some other organizations out there as well that certify people in first aid in CPR. Now, I would say your safety team members, at minimum, should be trained, certified through one of these organizations as first aid, CPR, certified type people. From there, start looking beyond that. What about staff? So think of your Monday through Friday. Who's there? You know, is it the pastor and a secretary? You know, can we get the secretary trained? Can we get the pastor trained? Um, if there's other people there, you know, who can we get trained for that during the week stuff? Then, of course, your other programs beyond services and midweek and whatever else you might go on. You know, who's there that has some sort of medical training? Now, we can adjust the level of training that they have. So a lot of um, these places, I know the American uh, Heart Association does this, where they have a compressions only CPR class. And what this is, I think they call it the family and friends program. And they'll come in, oftentimes you can find somebody who will charge you almost nothing to get this training done. And at least people learn the compressions only CPR. And so I guess what I'm ultimately getting at, at is this. Look at your human resources, look at the people you have, and look at the different levels and try to get as many people trained as possible. You know, maybe it's starting with just that friends and family and then maybe they get the CPR um, certification and then beyond that maybe their CPR and first aid training and maybe you have some EMTs or paramedics that have additional training <clears throat> maybe you have a, a nurse and a doctor and just get as many people trained as possible the next thing that you have to look at is you have to look at equipment now I how do I say this okay so for the most part you know those cabinets you buy or those pre-packed first aid kits? 
those are okay. They serve a purpose, but they generally have very low level supplies in there. So a good example is your cabinet might have, you know, band-aids in there. You know, it might have a little roll of gauze. It might have medications in there, you know, pain relievers, antacids, that kind of stuff. You know, maybe they have some emergency shears and all that kind of stuff. And those cabinets are great and you definitely should get them. You know, put one up in the children's section, you know, up high so the kids can't get to it. You know, put one in the kitchen if you have a kitchen. Maybe put one in the office for the people that work there during the week. These are great. You know, these are more of your little injuries that just become annoyances and can load, slow down work production or, or, you know, just cause different, you know, disruptions of one level, if you will. Those are absolutely great. You definitely should get them. But the next thing that you should get is you should get a medical bag. And with that medical bag, what I would do is talk to your most highly trained person and say, what do you want in this bag you know that you would need in case of emergency to keep somebody alive to keep somebody as stable as possible until the ambulance gets here the paramedics get here and depending on their skill level they're going to give you a list of things they would like to see in that bag and do your best to make that bag for your most qualified person from then on now you're kind of looking at your team, maybe classrooms, things to that effect, where maybe you want something now that's going to fit your, your general safety team member or you're somebody who's going to be trained to deal with a mass trauma event or something more serious. So one of the things that we did is we partnered up with uh, medical or Mountain Man Medical. And what we did with them is this, is we created basically two types of medical kits. Now the first type of medical kit that we created, actually named after this company, you know, this organization, it's called the um, Sheepdog Belt IFAC. Now what this is for, is this is for your trained safety team members, maybe people who have gone through Stop the Bleed type training, and they carry it on them. And the idea here is this, it's not meant to be a comprehensive medical bag. It's not meant to be everything they would possibly need. What it is, it's a pack that has the things that they need that are necessary right now within, you know, we're talking within seconds of response. What are the things they need to save a life? So the things that are in there is a tourniquet. It's got a tourniquet in there. so. If somebody's bleeding, like some of you know, you can bleed out within seconds if a major artery is hit in the arm or the leg. You have no time to go run and get a medical bag. You have to do it right now. So there's a tourniquet in there for that purpose. Next thing, it has an Israeli pressure bandage. So if you're familiar with these, these are this is gonna be your below a tourniquet use, um, but just barely. You can use this bandage to put direct pressure on the wound, wrap it up nice and tight, get that pressure there to help slow and or stop the bleeding. Other things it has in there, it has a pair of medical gloves because we want to make sure that we're being safe. It has a pair of shears because obviously if you're going to put on a tourniquet or a pressure bandage, you want to cut the clothing away from that wound so you can see it and you can apply it uh, correctly. The other thing we put in there is we put in a CPR uh, face shield. The reason we do that is not for the mass trauma events because as we've spoken before, if somebody has severe trauma and they're not bleeding, you move on to a patient that has severe wounds and is still bleeding. Um, but anyway, you still could be in a situation where somebody goes down, you want to be able to get out that CPR mask, and while somebody runs to go get the AED and the medical bag, all that good stuff, you can start providing chest compressions and, um, and then of course breaths. The next thing that we created with them is our mass trauma kit. In fact, when we put this mass trauma kit together, it became one of their top sellers. 
And the idea behind these mass trauma kits is this, is the trauma kit is made for roughly 50 people. Now let me be um, clear about that. It's not that you can treat 50 people. The idea is you look across your congregation and say, okay, we have 50 people, we need one of these. We have 100 people, we need two of these, you know, and so forth. So that's basically how it works. And the idea behind these mass trauma kits is this, is that maybe they're put into a duffel bag. So in case of a mass trauma, somebody could grab that bag and start throwing them out to the safety team. Now remember, the safety team has the IFAC, so they're already helping people, but they need to be resupplied so they can continue to treat people. Or what they could be, you could do with them is you could strategically pay, place them around the church. And as long as your team, staff, and other trained personnel know exactly where they are, if there's a mass trauma event, they could grab that bag and they could start treating people. So what's in the mass trauma bag? You got two tourniquets, two Israeli style high pressure bandages, you have four pairs of gloves, you have um, your shears, your, your trauma shear, shears to cut off um, clothing. You have, your, um, you have two um, chest seals. You have a permanent black marker so you can write dates and stuff like that or times of treatment on the tourniquet. Um, you have an emergency rescue blanket. You have pre-lubricated combat medic nasal airways. Um, you have, um, you have um, your hemostatic dressing, you have rolled gauze, you have triangle bandage for a cravat, and then you have uh, CPR seals. And like I said, the whole idea behind that is you buy one of these kits for every 50 people in your church, and if there's a mass trauma event, you can grab that and or have that handed to you after you started already with your IFAC, and now you're resupplied, so you continue to treat more people. So how you organize that really depends on the layout of your church and what's gonna work best for you. I liked the idea of basically getting a duffel bag and sticking you know, four or five of these, you know, based on the size of your church, four or five of these. And then as my team starts providing immediate aid with their IFAC, then one person goes, grabs that duffel bag, runs around, and tosses out, resupplies all the team. But once again, other churches like to have strategically placed stuff. So anyway, that's, that's basically it. Get training, get the equipment. Figure out who you have and what training they have and what kind of training they need, and then looking at the supplies that are gonna help them do what they need to do. Because if there ever is an emergency situation, are, is your team prepared? Are they equipped? If there's a mass trauma event, what's the plan? So one of the things that we're doing because we believe so much in this is not so much working with uh, Mountain Man Medical, which I completely support, I love these guys. But on the other hand too is that we've developed a new module that God willing is gonna come out this summer and it's gonna be added to our training and it's on mass trauma events. How do we triage people? How do we, you know, what equipment do we need? How are we gonna respond under fire if, if, if it occurs? You know, how can we help people? So make sure you stay tuned, just pay attention if you're interested in that kind of training. You know, certainly, like I said, consider joining up with us or you know, there's a lot of those Stop the Bleed courses out there. Get, your, get that going on at your church so you're prepared. Other than that, if you like this video, please like, comment, share. Let's start a conversation. Let's, you know, let's get better together. You know, that's what this program is all about. It's continuing education for you who have been through my training. For those who have not, you know, I like to think we give very good information here to help you out. There's a lot of other people in your church and in your neighborhood and really around the country that could benefit from this training. And probably more important, you know, what about your experience? What about what you know, how you can add to this conversation? So please comment and let's get a conversation started. Other than that, thank you so much for tuning in this week and hey, let's be careful out there.
This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.